Previous lectures, we studied a little bit uh, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formalism and their relation. And finally, we get to some examples of constrained systems. So what is constrained? Constrained Hamiltonian. System. It's a system described by the following action. I always, I'm always trying to explain that a good idea is to think of all these objects as certain, certain Lagrangian system at the end of the day. So in terms of the action, because this gives a clear inter physical interpretation of what we are doing. And the action reads like this. So it says usually we have kinetic term. Uh, let me recall you that this is a uh, symplectic potential with, uh, with differential the symplectic structure minus H of Z minus lambda alpha T alpha. Yeah, that's a general action of a constrained Hamiltonian system. So these guys are called constraints. These guys are called Lagrange multipliers. And this is Hamiltonian for simplicity not to complicate the exposition. I, I assume that d over dt of h is zero and d over dt of t alpha is also zero. So we don't have explicit time dependence of Hamiltonian constraints. This is not important purely technical, but just to avoid some unnecessary complications and also in uh, physically relevant systems, at least relativistic uh, particle, spinning particle models, which are from a certain interest from field theory perspective or like string, uh, th these conditions are satisfied. Okay, good. So let, what are our equations of motion? So what we have here, so we uh, first we take a variation with respect to z. So what we get is Right, that's the first equation which we obtained by varying with respect to uh, Z, ZA, right? So this can be rewritten. Let me remind you that this object here is precisely the matrix of symplectic structure. So we can rewrite it as omega AB Z dot B. Uh, but even, okay, the first term goes like this, but then let's save space and multiply this by an invertible matrix invertible to omega. What happens? It, it, it's going to, then it can be rewritten as z dot b minus omega b c uh, dh over dz c minus lambda alpha 
Mengabe C DG alpha or DZ C, right? And this is, of course, now we recall that our Poisson bracket in this case is just uh, right. For instance, here we have F, here we have G, FG. Yeah, the arrows indicate how we differentiate. For the moment, we don't have fermionic variables. So it's not necessary to introduce left and right derivatives, but here it's just to indicate in which direction they go. It's a useful formula because it keeps the same form in a super case. Okay, good. Uh, and this is, of course, can be written as in terms of Poisson brackets. So z dot b equals to z b with h plus z b with t alpha lambda alpha and now the remaining equation because we have uh, variables z and lambda dependent variables in our in our system so the second equation is obtained by varying with respect to lambda alpha and this of course gives t alpha equals zero Right, so this is our uh, uh, this is uh, these are our Euler Lagrange equations for this system. Uh, they are first order, and they can be considered as a generalization of uh, usual Hamilton equation because they include the term, they include the constraint equation. This explains the name, right? Because it's like a constraint of our trajectory, so all trajectories should. Uh, belong to the surface where t alpha equals zero. So the geometric picture should look like this. Well, let me maybe go to the next thing. So geometric picture should look like this. So we have our uh, phase space, big one, M. And then there is a surface, sigma, which is singled out by like points in M such that T alpha of P is zero, right? So th this is called constraint surface, constraint surface. Okay, and if we study our evolution, if we start at zero time at a point uh, be belonging to this surface, and we can't start with anything else because otherwise equations are not satisfied. Then it starts to evolve somehow, but all it's with the time. So we have a we have like a flaw, but all this curve which it, which describes our evolution belongs to sigma. Why? Because we have these equations, constraint equations, right? Okay, good. But now, the very important point is that we have to study the consistency of this system. Because it's not immediately obvious, but we have this equation T alpha equals zero. And we can form a consistency condition because T alpha is zero on true trajectories. It should also hold the T alpha dot equals to zero. But T alpha dot at the same time is what? It's D T alpha over D Z A, right? Z A dot. But Z A dot, we can substitute from the first equation of our system. So we do it. What we get? We get uh, D T alpha over d z a z a h plus uh, d t alpha over d z uh, a z a t beta lambda beta right okay 
And this can be rewritten as a T alpha H plus T alpha T beta lambda beta. Is it clear? So what I use here is the following fact that for df for any function f on our thing, z a g equals to f g, right? You just need to substitute the definition of Poisson bracket and you will see that it precisely gives this. So that's what I used. That's what I used here, right? So when we look at this consistency condition, because it's like additional equation, we can just add it to our system, right? Because it's a consequence of, uh, of the equations, right? So what we do, we take, we take a time derivative, total time derivative of this equation, and then use the first equation in this derivative, right, to express z, z dot uh, z dot in terms of uh, in terms of this, and we get this uh, consistency condition. So it is clear that dynamics of our system uh, depends substantially on the properties of this matrix, right? Well, it's matrix with, whose entries are functions on our phase space. And this matrix is called Dirac matrix. So, alpha beta, T alpha T beta, by definition, it's Dirac matrix. And, um, the first important case, not the most interesting, but uh, important, is the special case where delta alpha beta is invertible. And we denote by uh, its inverse just by putting indices up. Economical uh, delta alpha gamma. Yep. So the inverse is denoted by the same symbol, but with indices up. And this is direct matrix. So if it is invertible, uh, this system is called second class. Second class constraint system. This is terminal. This terminology was introduced by Dirac, who studied uh, the dynamics and quantization of uh, systems more 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 general than usual Hamiltonian systems. Okay, so this is a definition of second class constraint system. So our we, the action has the following form, and uh, this matrix, uh, the Dirac matrix determined by constraints is invertible. This, by definition, this is a second class constraint system. So why, what happens if uh, delta alpha beta is invertible? This equation, the consistency condition, can be solved with respect to lambda, right? So let's say consistency. Can be solved with respect to lambdas, right? So we just say that lambda beta is nothing but minus delta beta alpha. T H, right? That's that's what happens. 
uh, am I right with the sign? So if I multiply about the bit. Yes. Okay. And then we can, so we can express, you see what happens. We can express our Lagrange multipliers as algebraic functions. There are no derivatives in the right-hand side of this equation, we can express our Lagrange multipliers as functions of the remaining variable z, right? Because delta is a function of z, and t alpha are functions of z, and h is function of z. So we just compute uh, this right-hand side, and we know what lambdas are. So you see the consistency condition is very strong. It allows us to express lambda in terms of other variables, so we can forget about it. And what we are going to do now, we are going to rewrite the first equation uh, and substitute the lambda. So what, what, what we're gonna have is here, right? So z dot, z dot a, we saw that it is z a with h. And now, uh, let me there is a minus coming from z a t alpha delta alpha beta t beta h. I just substituted in place of lambdas. So these are minus lambda expressed in terms of other variables. Okay. And uh, so we see you see, we completely got rid of lambdas. So now we just stay with uh, z variables and our system of equations of motion took the following form. It's entire, it's first order in terms of z. Still we have the constraint equation and we have a first order equation determining evolution, which has the following structure. Right. It can be rewritten using the very useful object called Dirk bracket. By definition, Dirk bracket of two functions fg, denoted like this, is just a Poisson bracket minus Right, so our first equation, now our system can be written as z dot a is z a with h direct bracket. And the second equation remains the same, t alpha is zero. You see, so finally we got again the almost the Hamiltonian system, but uh, because these are, these look these look exactly like Hamilton equations, right? But what's the difference? The difference is that this Poisson bracket sitting here, Dirac bracket, well, I have not yet said that it's a Poisson, but this bracket, this bilinear differential operator, first order differential operator, uh, our, our equation look exactly like uh, Hamilton equation, but with Poisson bracket replaced with Dirac bracket, but on top of this, we have T alpha equals zero. And what is important is that this Dirac bracket is degenerate. So let's see properties. So properties. Of Dirac bracket. First of all, well, it's absolutely obvious that fg Dirac is minus gf Dirac, right? The Poisson bracket is anti-symmetric and this second term uh, correcting. So you see Dirac bracket is like a correction of Poisson bracket and this correct correction term is also anti-symmetric because uh, the matrix delta alpha beta is anti-symmetric by construction. 
because it, it originated from Poisson bracket of constraints. Of course, it's, you see only first derivatives of functions f and g enter the expression for Dirac brackets. That's why there should be Leibniz identity. So let's also write it f g h Dirac equals to f g Dirac h plus g f h Dirac, right? So the operation of taking a bracket with respect to f differentiates the product of functions. So satisfy the usual Leibniz rule as if it, so which means that bracket with f is a first order differential operator. Okay, uh, so this these two properties are nearly obvious. If uh, they are not obvious, then do it as an exercise. And uh, there is a third property, which uh, in fact is much less trivial. In this case, it's this, it's a Jacobi identity. So two more terms with cyclic permutations of FGH equals to zero. So in fact, this property is difficult to prove. It's probably not obvious why, but in fact it is. And uh, the, the proof I know uses some extra constructions and becomes not difficult. But what is easy to prove is that Jacobi identity, oh, sorry, here is should be D, of course, otherwise it's uh, for Boston bracket, it's obvious. What is easy to prove is a simplified version of this identity, which uh, looks like this. So it, we put exactly the same, so we introduce the following equality. So we say that f approximately equals g. This means that f minus g, when we set t alpha to zero, geometrically it means that we restrict our that we restrict our function to the surface determined by t alpha equals zero. That this f uh, the, the, the difference vanishes. So then we say that two, two functions are equivalent in this sense, which means they, they coincide on the constraint surface. So using this, uh, the, what, what is easy to prove, and this is, well, a relatively easy exercise, exercise is to prove that f g h Dirac plus cycle same equals to zero on the constraint surface. So the hint how to do it is to observe that by, let me give a hint here, Mm, yeah, maybe here, not to start new page, that if we have F G Poisson can be rewritten as F G Dirac, where G is G plus T alpha times something. So we can correct our function by, by a term proportional to T alpha to make like the two brackets coincide. In fact, what I forgot to, so this is a hint. So this is a hint for this exercise. Uh, what I, the very important property which I forgot to mention so let me do it here. T alpha. Mm -hmm. 
the direct bracket of any function with the constraint is zero. Right? In fact, it's quite easy. Look at the definition of the direct bracket. So if we put, instead of G, we put a constraint, for instance, T gamma, then here we have delta with indices down, just the direct matrix. Here's the inverse, so they give one, so we get F with constraint, F with constraint, but sine is minus, so it's zero. So T alpha are, sometimes they are called Casimir functions for the direct bracket. Casimir functions for a Poisson bracket are such functions which uh, commute with anything in the sense of a Poisson bracket. So maybe let me give this as a small definition because it's a terminology which is used often. So if we have Poisson bracket, and then function C is Casimir, if CF is zero, for any f in C infinity are manifold, right? For instance, if uh, our Poisson bracket is non degenerate, like in usual Hamiltonian mechanics, then the only Casimir functions are who? What are Casimir functions of usual non degenerate Poisson bracket? Constance. Constance, right, yeah, because otherwise, otherwise uh, you can't get this. But for Poisson bracket, all functions of constraints, which are, which all functions of the form f of t alpha of z, so they are Casimir functions. So this algebra of Casimir functions is generated by, by constraints. That's another way to say this. Okay, uh, so what do we see? So let's get back to our dynamics. So let me remind you that our cell race, uh, our equations of motion, evolution of our uh, second class system, is determined by this. So the picture, let me also draw it again. So we have our surface sigma. And now that's how evolution goes. If we start with a certain initial data, then we have a flaw of flow of this equation of the first one and all the flow all the evolution belongs to the surface sigma right that's what it looks like in fact uh, probably you already started to suspect that if t alpha are regular and this is usual assumption which we always are regular what does it mean? It means that they can be taken as part of a coordinate system, at least locally. Equivalent, uh, this matrix on the surface has maximum rank. Then we know if these conditions are satisfied, then sigma is a good surface, good submanifold. And in fact, you see all physical dynamics happen happens in uh, this surface sigma and is governed by this equation, which look pretty much like Hamilton equation. And actually, it can be consistently restricted to sigma where it becomes really just a Hamilton equation. So let's try to understand it. So of course, Dirac bracket, 
is defined for functions on uh, our phase space. Uh, on, on, this is M, this is our big phase space. But in fact, it defines, it defines a Poisson bracket on the surface sigma. Uh, let's try to understand how, it, how, how this can be seen. And the crucial point, which is kind of a standard step we, we are going to use many times is to is to realize the algebra of functions on sigma. So C infinity of sigma can be realized as a C infinity of M modulus the ideal generated by constraints. So what, 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 what do we have? So this is a commutative associative algebra, just algebra of functions on our manifold M. Then we can take any, so what is what is ideal? Ideal of T alpha is by definition, it consists of functions of the form F alpha T alpha, where F alpha is whatever. It's clear that if we multiply function of this type by uh, anything, it remains to be of the same type, right? So it's still proportional to T alpha. That's why it's ideal. So by definition, ideal is a subalgebra such that if you multiply element of this subalgebra by anything, you end up again in the subalgebra. Then we say that this is ideal and we know that there is, if there is an ideal, we can take a quotient. It's again an algebra. So the idea is to realize functions on sigma as such a quotient. This is precisely, do you remember when I introduced this F equals G in this weak, weak sense, which means that F minus G vanishes in sigma. This is in fact the equivalence relation needed to uh, to take this quotient algebra, right? Because what are elements of this, what are elements of this quotient algebra? These are precisely equivalence classes of functions such that their difference is proportional to T alpha. But here there is a subtle point because uh, we know of course that if function is proportional to T alpha, it necessarily vanish on sigma, right? Because T alpha vanish on sigma by definition. But if we have a generic function vanishing on sigma, is it necessarily, can it necessarily be represented as a function proportional to T alpha? In fact, it, 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 it can. And let me formulate this as an exercise and I'll give a hint how to do it. Exercise, show that if, if for instance, F on sigma equals zero, it follows, oh, so G, yeah, that G equals to G alpha T alpha for some functions alpha. This is only true if T alpha is, uh, is, is uh, if T alpha are regular constraints, so they can be taken as part of coordinate system. Because uh, let me give you an example. For instance, if, uh, let's say we are in our M, is just R1. In fact, it's enough to illustrate the idea. The rest is more or less straightforward. And let's take T alpha equal to X, just a standard coordinate on R1, 
well, t uh, index alpha is not present because it runs only one value, so we are not forced to we are not forced to write it. Okay, then the statement I'm talking about me, uh, is the following: if f of zero equals zero, and every all functions are smooth, it follows that f is equal x times some function g of x. And this can be proved using certain integral representation. So that's an exercise. To, and this is, of course, just a naive generalization when we have multidimensional generalization of this statement. So this is a very important technical step because whenever we say that function vanish on the constraint surface, we can immediately write it as our function is proportional to constraints, and this is going to be extremely useful. So here is an example. So, uh, so our statement, let's for a change, state it as a proposition. Dirac bracket is well defined. on C infinity M over our ideal generated by T alpha. So how do we prove it? Uh, we, what, what does it mean that the operation is well defined on a quotient space? It means that if we evaluate it on equivalence classes, the result doesn't depend on equivalence classes. So the operation descends. So what does it mean? It means that we can define our Dirac bracket, let's say, reduced, which is already on uh, functions on uh, our, so Fg, we take Fg on C infinity sigma. So we define the bracket of two functions on uh, sigma to be just direct bracket of f with g, where, oh, you know, it's even better notation. I removed it here. Anyway, it's a reduced bracket. So there is no need to write d, not to, to, not to make conventions very heavy. So fgd, this is by definition where f on sigma is small f and g on sigma is small g. So you see, what does it mean? How do we compute uh, this reduced bracket of two functions on sigma? We uplift it in some way to capital F, capital G, such that they restrict on sigma to our small f and small g. And then we evaluate direct bracket and then restrict it to sigma. So we again get, get a function on sigma, right? So if we have a function on, a, on uh, our phase space, we can always restrict it. Just evaluate it only on points of our, our sigma. So it, it looks like a nice definition, but it has to be proved that it is well-defined. What does it mean well-defined? Is that it does not depend on the way in which we uplift our small f to our capital F. But we just saw that two different, that any function vanishing on, uh, on uh, sigma is proportional to T alpha. So if we have two different lifts, for instance, f and f prime. So f on sigma gives f, f prime on sigma also gives f. Then it follows, of course, that f minus f prime vanishes on sigma, and hence it is proportional to constraints. So it can be represented in the following way. Okay, good. So this means that consistency means that if f, if we replace f with f prime in our definition, 
it should coincide with uh, it, 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 nothing should change, right? So addition of this term should result in nothing, in zero. So let's check it. So let's evaluate. So there is obvious first term, which is just Fg, Poisson bracket, uh, Dirac bracket restricted to sigma. But then there is a second term. And the second term, uh, let me remind you, the Dirac bracket has Jacobi identity, right? So there will be two terms originating from from this one, right? When the uh, when the direct bracket hits F and when it hits T. But when it hits, hits T is zero because T is a Casimir function. So there is actually only one of the two survives. And we get here, uh, what? We get here T alpha, F alpha, G, Dirac, and all this stuff restricted to sigma. But this is zero, right? Because here we have constraint. Same goes if we, we, we can do exactly the same for the second argument. Anyway, bracket is anti-symmetric, so it doesn't matter. And we just proved that this reduced bracket defined like this does not depend on the choice of representatives, doesn't depend on the choice of the lift of functions fg to functions on the entire phase space, capital F and capital G. Right, so it turns out that uh, this uh, reduced bracket, reduced bracket is a Poisson bracket. Let me remind you that we had an exercise that uh, Dirac bracket satisfies Jacobi identity up to terms vanishing on sigma. But as anyway, reduced bracket is obtained by reducing to sigma, then it satisfies Jacobi identity, so it's a Poisson bracket. And in terms of this bracket, our evolution now is just uh, Z. I z i dot equals to z i h restricted to sigma reduced. And there is no second equation because second equation was the constraint equation, right? In our in our system. So the, the, there were two equations, the first one and the second one. And the second one was a constraint equation, but now we, we, we just solved it because we restricted to the constraint surface. So we ended up with just this equation, which is precisely Hamilton equation with respect to reduced bracket. And here I introduced notations that z i are coordinates on sigma. I use the same z, but index is different. You see? So the, we, 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 we got the Hamiltonian system. So what happened is that our dynamics, because we saw that our dynamics is restricted to the stationary surface, or oh, sorry, to constraint surface. And on this constraint surface, it becomes just a usual Hamiltonian dynamics with the Poisson bracket being the restriction of the bracket and the Hamiltonian being the restriction of the Hamiltonian. So this sigma together with uh, this bracket reduced and reduced Hamiltonian Let's introduce notation for it, which is H restricted to sigma, is called reduced phase space. So, uh, so this reduced phase space is a usual phase space of a Hamiltonian system. 
So the physical interpretation is very simple. It simply tells us that second class constraint systems are usual Hamilton systems on Sigma, right? So nothing happened. We have not, by considering second class constraint systems, we have not found anything conceptually different from usual Hamiltonian system. So you can think that second class system is a way to rephrase dynamics on sigma in terms of uh, extended dynamics on a certain extended phase space. It may look a bit uninteresting, Indeed, conceptually, nothing happens, but technically, it can be still quite interesting and this type of systems arise in, uh, in applications and it's uh, useful to understand this sort of relations. Why? Because what might happen in applications is that this surface sigma is extremely tricky nonlinear submanifold, non-linear non, 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 non manifold, where it's even difficult to find a good coordinate system to compute something. The expression for the reduced bracket can be also quite tricky and also for reduced Hamiltonian. So you can't really work in these terms. That's why it may be it can be very useful in applications to uplift all this to a bigger space where the bracket is a simple bracket and the Hamiltonian is a reasonably simple function. So this can have uh, technical advantages in the analyzing this system and in particular in uh, quantizing, uh, quantizing this system. So they are not completely in second class constraint systems are not completely uh, useless they are useful actually. But indeed we, we don't get to a new, to a conceptually new type of systems. And uh, we are going to see that this is not the case with first class constraint systems because these indeed bring us to a new class, uh, to a new class of dynamical system, precisely these gauge systems. Okay, good. Before going there, let's, do, let me make few more remarks. So physical interpretation in terms of observables. Because you see the, the way I gave just about ju just here, the way I gave physical interpretation to second class constraint systems, uh, was based on the notion of reduced phase space, which, as I said, can be quite a bad object and in field theory it can be not entirely local, so you would prefer not to work with it. That's why it is useful to give a physical interpretation in terms of initial data, so in terms of initial system, in terms of M Poisson bracket, well, let's say Dirac bracket, uh, age t alpha constraints. So uh, then we need uh, how it can be done. It can be done in quite an invariant language to talk about physical systems like this. It's a language of observables. In usual Hamilton, for usual Hamiltonian systems, all functions on our phase space are observables because uh, we can, in Hamiltonian dynamics, we can evaluate any function, all 
points of our phase space represent difficult, sorry, represent different physical states. Uh, that's why if we have two different functions, we can always uh, find a state where the values are different. Because otherwise, if we count, it means that they are identical observables. So observables in usual Hamiltonian dynamics are functions on phase space. But now something changes because uh, as we saw, real physical observables are functions on sigma. So observables uh, on of, 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 of our constraint system, they are still functions on M, but two observables, F is said equivalent to G if F minus G vanish if they coincide on the constraint surface, right? So it's still useful to work in terms of functions on M. So we call any function of M observable, but the really like inequivalent observables is this quotient space of all functions modulo those vanishing on sigma. So the definition of observable is that it's a function but two observables are called equivalent if they coincide on sigma. And the quotient space is a space of inequivalent observables. Okay, and then uh, of course uh, there is an evolution, right? If we don't want to pick coordinates, then we write Hamilton equation like this, right? We say that an evolution of an observable is determined by these equations, right? This is a Hamilton equation with respect to with respect to Dirac bracket. And indeed, the evolution of uh, this evolution is well defined. on equivalence classes. What do I mean? If I take F and study how it evolves uh, with time, and then I can take equivalent F, equivalent, equivalent observable G, such that, uh, such that F and G coincide on the surface, then in general, I get a different evolution. But in fact, the, the evolution, this, this evolution is going to be equivalent in the sense that the difference between, uh, between for instance, uh, time derivative of F and G is going to vanish on the constraint surface. So that F, let me write it like this. So let's study evolution of F minus G, right? We know that this is F minus G Dirac bracket. This is uh, F minus G should be proportional because it vanishes on sigma, it should be proportional to constraints. So here we put some functions F alpha T alpha instead of F minus G H Dirac. And now we remember the T alpha Casimir functions for the Dirac bracket. So what the only remaining term is going to be T alpha F alpha H Dirac. So you see the, diff the time derivative of uh, the difference is proportional to T, which means that our, uh, so that our trivial observable, which is which is F minus G because it vanished on sigma, its evolution is again proportional to T alpha. So evolution is well defined for equivalence classes. Of course, this is just a reformulation of uh, the physical interpretation in terms of sigma, where we identify, where we think of sigma as a quotient of our Manifold of functions, functions on sigma, observables on sigma, 
we realize them as a quotient space of functions on all uh, all phase space modulo the ideal generated by the constraints. So you see, in this in 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 this language, we don't need to explicitly work with uh, surface sigma. We still work in terms of functions on entire phase space, but we have to be careful to remember that there is an equivalence. Uh, there is an equivalence relation between observables and that the physical meaning have only equivalence classes of observables. But still, we avoid using the coordinates on sigma and explicitly working with sigma. Okay, and then there is one more like geometrical remark. And also exercise. Uh, it's even better, in fact, although the way I uh, explained was based on Poisson bracket, it's even better to understand the geometry, at least from conceptual point of view, it's better to understand the geometry of, of second class systems in terms of symplectic form. So uh, let me remind you that we can, if, if, if the Poisson bracket is non-degenerate, it is equivalent to symplectic structure, right? So if we have omega, which is uh, half omega a, b, digit a, digit b, so d omega is zero, and omega a, b, invertible everywhere. Then we say that omega is a symplectic structure, right? And Poisson bracket is determined by the inverse. So it's omega, we take inverse, and then Poisson bracket is just D A F omega A B D B G. And then it is non-degenerate if omega is non-degenerate. Okay, so what 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 happens is in, in the case of second class constraint system, we know that if we have a submanifold sigma in M. We can restrict our our symplectic form omega to sigma. Let's call it omega sigma. Restrict means uh, is it is it? Shall I explain why differential forms restrict to submanifolds? Or oh, everybody knows this. Please explain if you can. Okay, uh, so the idea is very simple. Okay, for instance, coordinate. Or maybe, okay, geometrical first, geometrical picture. So we have a surface, right? And we have a, suppose we take two vectors tangent to the surface, like V1, V2. At the point P, which is in the surface. So what does it mean that we have a differential form? It means that it on sigma, on each point, on each point of sigma, we have a rule how to evaluate. We, we have an anti-symmetric bilinear form on a tangent space. So it's a rule which associates to two tangent vectors a number. And this happens at each point, right? That's what it means that we we defined uh, we defined a two form on uh, on the surface right so how can we do it if we have a two form on our ambient space on the entire an entire m then we just restrict it we just go to a particular point which is a point of sigma and take particular vectors which are tangent vectors to sigma and evaluate our omega and say that this rule is precisely the two form on sigma. So it's very straightforward. You do nothing. You just evaluate your form, restrict your form to vectors tangent to sigma and do it only at points belonging to sigma. And you get a two form on sigma. The same, of course, you can do with all possible with forms of different degrees. It's exactly the same as a restriction of function 
of, of functions to, uh, to, to the surface sigma because you have a function on M. How do you obtain out of a function on M a function on sigma? You just say, well, look, I form a new function whose values at a point P, P of, of, our, of my sigma is just a value of my initial function. So this gives me this gives me a new function, but morally it's the same function. You just evaluate it on a subset of your initial set. Same with forms, but uh, the addition is that you have to you have to also say that you evaluate it not on all vectors, but only on vectors tangent to sigma. Okay, you can also do it in coordinate terms if you. For instance, if you have, well, let's use the same. So ZA are coordinates on M. Let's say ZI are coordinates on sigma. It's not a very good convention, but economically, we use only one Z. Uh, what does it mean that sigma is a surface in M? It means that uh, the embedding of this surface is defined, right? So it means that ZA are some functions, let me put bar here, of ZI. So what, what does this equality mean? It means that if we know, if we have a point with coordinate ZI, it's a point on the surface, but at the same time, it's a point of M, a particular point. And on M, we have a coordinate system ZA. So we can ask what are coordinates of these points. And these are given by uh, by this ZA. Well, strictly speaking, these ones, right? So it it such an equality defines an embedding of sigma into M. Good. And if we have a form omega A B, D Z A D Z B, we can uh, immediately form the following one. We can form we can find omega J which is just omega a b of z bar of z i and here we can have dz bar a or oh, dz i dz i well i don't have space wedge dz bar b or oh, dz j dz j right so it's a just a transformation law of a covariant tensor, but the trick is, of course, that this transformation law involves this Jacobian matrix, which is degenerate in this case in general, because we go to a surface with of uh, lower dimension. Okay, so this is also okay, and in invariant language is again language of this pullback. So we know if there is a there is an embedding map of i sigma to m. Then we can find, a, then there is a canonical map i star called pullback of i, which sends functions to the opposite direction. And in fact, this i star can be extended to differential forms, extend I star to differential forms by simply by saying that I star of a function is just the usual I star of a function, right? Just evaluation at point. But I star of df is by definition d of I star of f. And this we know. So we know how I star act on differentials. So we can then apply it to any differential form immediately because differential form can be represented as uh, some coefficients, which are functions times exterior product of uh, differentials of coordinate functions. Yeah, I forgot to say, of course, that I star of uh, alpha wedge 
that uh, is i star of alpha veg i star of beta and maybe let me also put here remind you what is i star of function so i star on f evaluated at point p is nothing but f evaluated at point i of p okay so uh, i think that's uh, quite an exhaustive uh, explanation of this restriction of forms but uh, i believe it's worth spending some time because this concept of pullback of restriction is very useful in all this business about constraint systems and uh, more general gauge systems and we will be always using this sort of this sort of language okay and uh, so now we know how to restrict our symplectic form to sigma but uh, now we should remember that we also can restrict our direct bracket to sigma right that's what we discussed so what happens we restrict our direct bracket to sigma and we restrict symplectic form to sigma if the restriction is invertible we can form a Poisson bracket just by inverting our symplectic structure on sigma we have a Poisson bracket so it looks like we have two different Poisson brackets right the one which is a restriction of direct bracket and another one which is determined by a pullback of symplectic structure and the statement is that they coincide so the direct bracket restricted to sigma is a Poisson bracket determined by determined by I star of Omega where I is an embedding Sigma to M okay so uh, the, the proof is going to be an exercise. Proof. But I need to give a hint because otherwise it's probably not so simple. So the idea is that for any hint if we have a function f on m then we can construct In the form of like series in constraints so we can go we can always because t as i said t are regular we can think of t as a part of coordinate system so the expansion in t is legitimate and of course when we set t to zero capital f and small f coincide right so we we can so if we think of f small f as an observable then capital f, f is an equivalent observable okay so there exists f such that um, this f t alpha is zero So we can always correct our observable small f to uh, equivalent observable such that it commutes, its Poisson bracket commutes with uh, T alpha. And in this, and then we can do it, we can find a special coordinate system. 
system consisting in T alpha and certain Z i such that T alpha Z i is zero. And in this coordinate system, all the statements becomes becomes trivial. You can you can check them in a straightforward way. Okay, uh, then um, let me give you an example of a kind of meaningful constraint system of second class, which is of course mechanical field theory. We are not yet discussing. So let's consider the system with the following Lagrangian. So xi coordinates on R3. And consider the following system. So let's take uh, action, which depends on x of t and lambda of t. Lambda is also kind of a Lagrange multiplier, but now it's a it's, the action is not Hamiltonian for the moment. <clears throat> Let's do it like this: dt x dot squared over two. Let's assume that there is some kind of uh, potential v of x and. Uh, Let's add the following term, lambda times x squared, well, as a vector, of course, minus one. So what this Lagrangian describes, it's like uh, if we forget about the last term, right? If you just concentrate on these two, we are talking about non-relativistic particle moving in our Euclidean three-dimensional space, right? And in general, there is a there is a potential. It's it's not important for our, for us now. But then there is an additional term, which looks pretty much like the term with constraint, but this is for the moment not a Hamiltonian constraint. It's a Lagrangian constraint. It's like constraint in Lagrangian formalism, and equations of motion tell us that x squared minus one is zero. So it means that the moving of, uh, so we have actually a sphere in our R3 and the, the, the motion of our particle is restricted because equations of motion tell us that uh, x squared equal to one, so our our particle moves on a sphere. It is not allowed to go off the sphere, right? So that's uh, that's uh, the Lagrangian system with constraint, right? And then we can ask, we can ask, okay, suppose we want to find a Hamiltonian formulation of this system. Maybe we want to quantize it to do something else but not a generic Hamiltonian formulation because one Hamiltonian formulation is very easy to obtain, right? You just observe that your configuration space of your Lagrangian system is just a sphere. There is a metric on a sphere and you can write a Hamiltonian system whose phase space is going to be cotangent bundle over, over the sphere. But then metric is nonlinear, the system becomes nonlinear and it's not so easy to work with it. There are different ways out, and one of the way, ways out is to do Hamiltonian system in terms of R3. So what does it mean? To introduce momenta, so we have xi, our coordinates. We want to introduce momenta pi, which are canonically conjugate. And we want to find a Hamiltonian system which describes the same physics. And it turns out the, the answer is simple. It can be obtained in different ways. And to do it carefully is going to be an exercise. It turns out that uh, 
this physical system can be described. So this is going to be M, our phase space. Phase space. Uh, that uh, this is going to be a second class constraint system. Why? Because uh, we have one constraint which restricts which restricts our our coordinate, but we also know physically if particle moves on uh, the motion of particle is restricted to a sphere, then momenta should also have only independent momenta should also have only two components, right? So they should be constrained on momenta variables as well. So we are going to have two constraints such that their constraint surface is going to be a is going to be a uh, cotangent bundle over our over our sphere. Okay, so let's. I think it's a good good question to consider as an exercise. So find find a constraint. Hamiltonian system on uh, this X I P J phase space describing the same dynamics. So, which, which is equivalent, or even better, more or more precise statement, this constraint system is going to be equivalent to this Lagrangian system. Same dynamics, same dynamics. And this is, pre this is a good illustration. It's very naive, but it precisely explains why second class constraint systems can be useful. Because they allow sometimes to simplify the description because naive way to do Hamiltonian description is to solve this constraint and also to restrict momenta to, uh, to to be tangent to the surface, but then you get a nonlinear, nonlinear Hamiltonian. But if you are doing uh, constraint systems, you can still define everything in terms of our flat, flat phase space. But the price for this is to have some additional constraints. And additional advantage in this case that this this uh, constraint Hamiltonian description of this system will have a manifest symmetry with respect to uh, orthogonal transformations of our space, right? We would prefer to have formulas where all these all these indices are contracted properly with the three-dimensional Euclidean metric, so we can easily do any linear change, any orthogonal change of coordinates, right? And this is also achieved by the uh, constraint Hamiltonian description of this system. So this is an example. Of course, there are more sophisticated examples, but this is quite typical. It's a toy model, but some kind of similar technique people use for already meaningful physical systems, of course, usually in relativistic case, but uh, maybe also in non-relativistic, it can be also interesting. OK, good. Uh, we have like ten, 10 minutes left, so let's uh, briefly, let, let me start discussing more interesting case of first class system and we continue it uh, on the next lecture. So first class constraint systems. So this is, of course, same story. The action reads like this. Again, let me remind you that a good idea is to think in terms of variational principle, because then you are sure what you're talking about. So chi a symplectic potential, z dot a minus h minus lambda alpha t alpha. That's our action principle, but now, so, we require the following. We require the T alpha, T beta vanish. It's opposite case. There is in general 
there are in general mixed cases where we have both first class and second class constraints. But as we saw second class constraints, at least conceptually to understand what's going on, we can always get rid of them just by replacing bracket with a direct bracket and then restricting to the to the surface. So that's why this case is already interesting and somehow sufficient where all constraints are first class. This means the following that their Poisson bracket with themselves vanish on the surface sigma. And another condition, which in fact will come out anyway as a compatibility condition, is that constraints should be preserved in time. And again, because evolution of the constraint is again given by uh, given by same equations of motion. And if you want uh, the constraint to be preserved in time, so it means that if we started with a point on phase space, which belongs to the surface, then the evolution of this point uh, should also belong to the constraint surface. That's why we require this. If we don't require this, we can find what's called secondary constraints, and we will have to again implement them to add them to our set of constraints and again end up with an extended system of the same type. So this is a definition of a first quantized constraint system. So it's same type of variational principle, but functions T alpha satisfy the following conditions. So they are first class and they are preserved uh, in time. Okay, so let's rewrite, let's rewrite this using our knowledge that uh, any function vanishing on sigma can be represented as a linear combination of constraints. So this can be alternatively this condition written under regularity assumption, which we always assume that T alpha can be taken as part of coordinate system. It means that there exist functions T alpha, beta, gamma, or Z, T gamma, right? So this is just a consequence. And the same here. T alpha H can be written as some functions V alpha, beta, or Z, T beta. That's just a way to, to rewrite it. Okay. Uh, Let's again have a look at equations of motion. So let me remind you that they read like this, z dot a equal to z a h plus z a t alpha lambda alpha and t alpha, oh, I can save space, you can put it here. E T alpha equals zero. So these are our equations of motion. Okay, but now in contrast to second class constraint case, if we study compatibility condition, which means that we require T alpha dot equals zero, this holds identically, right? Because what it amounts to it amounts to T alpha H plus T alpha T beta lambda beta is zero. But because both these guys, this and that, they vanish on the constraint surface and we are on the constraint surface thanks to this equation. This holds identically. Everything vanish, so T is preserved. Constraints T alpha are preserved in time. So there are no hidden equations, hidden consistency conditions. So this is a complete system. So what it looks like? It looks like if we, uh, so it's, let's, let's concentrate on the first equation. Uh, because second equation, just means that we need to pick our initial data to to be on the surface. And because consistency is fulfilled, uh, the evolution will stay on the surface. 
right? So let's concentrate on the second equation. Second equation is a system of ordinary, ordinary differential equations, right? First order. And there is a theorem telling us that for any uh, initial data, in our case, of course, it should be on the surface, and any function lambda, because on lambda we don't have any constraints, and any function lambda, we get a solution. So let's for, so for any, uh, well, let it be in red, for any lambda alpha of t, for any functions lambda of t, and any initial initial data z a zero equals to some z a zero of course uh, t of z zero is zero it should belong to the surface there exists a unique solution right it's a standard theorem solution z a of t at least for some at least for some neighborhood of zero in time, right? If we consider infinite evolution, there can be some topological tricks, which we don't want to consider for simplicity, but at least we can start our evolution and it is uniquely determined by these functions, lambda alpha and the initial data. But the initial data we know perfectly. If we have a Hamiltonian system, we need to pick an initial data, the values of the point on our phase space, and then it starts to starts to evolve and the evolution is unique, right? But here, there is something very strange. On top of our z variables, there are these other lambda variables on which we don't have any equations. We can just pick them to be whatever, whatever functions we want. So it means that if we fix an initial data, we have an infinite amount because the fun there is a functional arbitrariness in, in, in this. We have an infinite uh, amount of solutions of our equations, right? Uh, which is very strange. This is not the case in usual Hamiltonian mechanics. What is the physical interpretation of this? And the only reasonable physical interpretation is that actually all of them, all solutions with a given initial data and whatever functions lambda alpha, they must be considered as physically equivalent. And uh, the concept of gauge symmetry emerges because we say that uh, gauge transformation gauge transformation is, of course, it's a bit rougher. We will have a more precise definition. Gauge transformation is the one which takes uh, solutions with lambda alpha of t to another solution lambda prime alpha of t. So if we change these lambdas, we go from one equivalent solution to another equivalent solution, from one solution to another solution. And these two solutions, if they, are, they correspond to the same initial data, but different lambdas, they must be considered physically equivalent. And this is the first emergence of uh, what we, uh, of the very general phenomena. Uh, which of course have different faces, and but I believe this is a, the simplest possible and still physically relevant situation to, to, to explain what gauge symmetry is. So these Hamiltonian first class constraint Hamiltonian systems, they are often they describe real physics, but at the same time they give a simplest illustration of what of the phenomena of gauge invariance. So gauge systems are kind of degenerate. First class constraint systems, they're of course gauge systems. They are kind of degenerate Hamiltonian systems where the initial data 
do not determine fully the evolution. And there is a huge ambiguity in the evolution, and this ambiguity uh, has to do is interpreted as a as a gauge symmetry. So we, we believe that this we we, we we postulate actually that the two uh, two different trajectories having the same initial data but corresponding to different lambdas, they are physically equivalent. And transformation between them is a gauge transformation. It's a bit vague for the moment. Okay, so uh, time is over. So thank you for the attention.